Hey, Graysteel Nation, Sully here with the Barbell Prescription, keeping you strong and healthy in the second half of life. Thanks for watching, liking, and subscribing. COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, has been an important part of my life for a long time. My mother was a lifelong smoker who ultimately became a pulmonary cripple from chronic bronchitis, one of the two major phenotypes of the disease. The sound of her constant wet cough will haunt me until the end of my days. A career in emergency medicine confronted me with COPD exacerbations and emergencies on a daily basis. These cases were often very satisfying to treat because available therapies can often turn around patients in extremists with respiratory distress and respiratory failure if they come in soon enough. But some cases were nightmares, especially those who had been in distress for a day or more and arrived in the late stage of an exacerbation after simple airway spasm had progressed to inflammation, swelling, and mucus plugging. These cases frequently went upstairs to the intensive care unit, or downstairs to the eternal care unit. The global burden of COPD is horrific. One third of a billion people suffer from some form of the disease, and the US ranks high on the list of affected countries, with up to 1,000 deaths per million persons per year. The most common causes by far are environmental, and smoking is the major individual contributor to the incidence of the disease. Only rarely did I encounter a patient with COPD who had never smoked. The classical med school teaching is that COPD comes in two main flavors, emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Emphysematous patients in the late stages of the disease are called pink puffers, and they tend to be markedly underweight with a high degree of muscle wasting. The blue bloaters, those with chronic bronchitis, look just like it sounds. In emphysema, lung tissue is virtually dissolved away, resulting in large gaps that are incapable of gas exchange. In chronic bronchitis, chronic inflammation results in secretion of mucus and inflammatory changes that fundamentally alter the elasticity and compliance of airways and literally plug up gas exchanging structures. Like most classical teachings, this pink puffer blue bloater distinction is now understood to be simplistic and only somewhat helpful. COPD spans a range of different pathophysiological and clinical phenotypes, but they all result in the same basic problem, obstruction to airflow. Thus, COPD attacks one of the three pillars of clinical physiology. Blood must go round and round, air must go in and out, and oxygen is good. More specifically, COPD has a disproportionate effect on the air getting out and turns expiration from a passive process to an active process that increases the work of breathing. This means that early COPD primarily affects not oxygenation, but ventilation. Air checks in, but it can't check out. The patient can absorb oxygen, at least at first, but can't get rid of carbon dioxide efficiently. This can become a major problem, ultimately resulting in respiratory acidosis, which is even worse than it sounds. The patient also suffers from increased work of breathing and fatigue, what we used to call pooping out in the ER. Pooping out is never good. Fortunately, the disease is treatable with bronchodilators, corticosteroids, targeted anti-inflammatories, mucolytics, and smoking cessation with ventilatory support for severe exacerbations. Obviously, COPD can have a huge impact on quality of life. And it won't come as a shock to most of you to learn that the majority of patients with the disease are deconditioned, weak, sarcopenic, and sedentary. Now, common sense might suggest that exercise is out of the question, especially vigorous or intense exercise like heavy resistance training. But you know better, don't you? And indeed, there is an abundant and growing body of research on resistance training in the setting of COPD. The first issue that concerns us, as always, is safety. Liao et al. conducted a 2015 meta-analysis of randomized trials that investigated a combined total of 750 subjects and found that resistance training could be performed as part of pulmonary rehab without increased adverse events. Skeletal muscle mass and quality of life improved without a significant concomitant increase in exercise tolerance. Now, it must be pointed out that almost all of the incorporated studies were small and short, as usual, and suffered from the usual issues with prescription of clinically effective resistance training. 
A systematic review by Epson et al., also in 2015, found that strength training seemed to confer the same benefits as endurance training, but the authors were forced to conclude that the quality of evidence they had to work with ranged from moderate to very low quality. Their conclusion seemed to be that strength training versus endurance training was a six of one and a half dozen of the other proposition, which belies a certain disconcerting misapprehension of exercise medicine and exercise physiology. The same group confirmed their confusion in the summation of another study a year later, which concluded that although both endurance training and resistance training improve symptoms and exercise capacity, endurance training induces a more oxidative quadriceps muscle phenotype, counteracting muscle dysfunction in COPD. The flabbergasting and totally incorrect implication here is that older muscle with a greater ratio of high-powered, non-oxidative, non-aerobic type 2 fibers, the strong and powerful fibers preferentially lost in aging, is somehow dysfunctional. Astonishing. Menon et al. conducted an ultrasound assay of muscle mass in 45 COPD patients and 19 healthy controls in the setting of an eight-week program of isolated knee extensions and found muscle mass improvements and, not incidentally, suggested a clinically accessible modality point-of-care ultrasound by which doctors might follow improvements in muscle mass and COPD and other patients for whom they prescribe strength training, if they ever did, which they don't, but more on that later. One more to nail it down. Konsgaard et al. published a small but important pilot study of 18 patients undergoing a twice-weekly resistance training program and found that 12 weeks of such training resulted in increased strength, power, muscle size, functional performance, and self-reported health. So we're in familiar territory here. We have a powerful form of lifestyle and exercise medicine that can safely improve the health, function, and well-being of patients with an important degenerative disease of modern aging. But this medicine remains poorly studied, in part, because it's not a pharmaceutical that promises to make anybody filthy rich. And this powerful medicine is infrequently prescribed because clinicians aren't familiar with it or hold an antiquated view of the risks and benefits of profitably prescribed strength training. In summary, the large body of data we have on this topic is of middling quality at best, and some of it is ridiculous at worst. But it all points in the same direction. Patients with COPD can safely and productively train and improve their lives. If you have COPD, you need to stop smoking today. This will start slowing down progression of the disease immediately and improve respiratory function in many sufferers. You need to use your bronchodilator, your prevental, your albuterol, and so on, as necessary and without hesitation. You need to take your preventatives, your steroids and PDE4 inhibitors and so on, on schedule, without fail, and comply with any prescription for pulmonary rehab and pulmonary toilet or oxygen supplementation. And you need to get exercise. And that exercise must include strength training. Because, strangely enough, COPD does not protect us from the loss of bone, muscle, strength, and function that affects other adults. In fact, the opposite is true. COPD puts adults at higher risk of muscle loss and bone loss than their unafflicted counterparts of equal age. Adults with COPD need strength training for all the reasons everybody else needs it. Only more so. Thanks for watching. We've got more great content for the Athlete of Aging coming right up.